Thank you, Sandy. We want each of those of you that are joining us via satellite, wherever you are, to feel very much part of this program. And I'm going to give you a web address that you can log on to and send us an email and ask questions about the meetings. And in subsequent meetings, I'll come out with emails from all over the world and try to do some time, we'll budget time to answer questions. And there is also on this web page a place that you can actually click into a YouTube and you can record if you want a question and we'll put your face up on the screen and you'll ask me the question from some place in the world. So here's the address. You ready? Get a pen there. It's www.discoveries08.org. You got it? www.discoveries08.org. So whatever country in the world you're watching from, if you want to record, you can go in, get a little camera, record a question. If you've seen the recent American presidential debates, we're not going to go there tonight, ladies and gentlemen, but if you have seen those, you've seen the YouTube-type questions. We're going to do that here so we can make our program interactive. So feel free to do that, and in subsequent evenings this week, we're going to have an exciting time. Any question you have about the lectures, I want you to be able to ask them. Those of you who are in the, in the local audience, starting Tuesday night, we'll put a question box out there. If you have any questions about things that I've covered in the lectures, and something's not clear to you, we really want you to feel that you're very much a part, that this is an interactive process. So write your questions out, and we'll put a question box out, and starting uh, Tuesday, Wednesday night, I'll begin to answer some questions. Tonight, our topic is Iraq, an ancient king's dream, and our future. Do you remember where you were on September 11. Many historians look back and they say September 11 was the day the world changed. My wife and I were traveling through the Midwest of America and we were in Denver, Colorado. I was meeting with a group of pastors and we heard the report that a plane had flown into the World Trade Center, into the, one of the Twin Towers. We, as many other Americans, thought that this was some kind of accident, but we couldn't understand it at first as we were sitting there watching the news and listening to the news report of that first plane that crashed into the Twin Tower. We were stunned. We were astounded as with our eyes we saw the second plane crash into that second tower. Pretty soon we recognized quite quickly that this was not an accident, but it was a blatant terrorist attack on American soil. We sat there with our eyes glued to the television screen. We looked at the twisted metal. We watched as we saw the cinders and we looked at the broken glass as we watched. We sat there in horror, sensing that an attack had come on our soil. We knew that the future would never be the same again. We were even more astounded when looking at that TV screen, we saw a plane now heading for someplace else, heading for the Pentagon. And as that plane came and as it dove into the Pentagon, we recognized that there was more than one terrorist in the sky and more than one attack that was taking place. Shortly after the attacks, I took a film crew and went out with the other major media corporate uh, giants in America, out with CNN and ABC and NBC, and we began taping television programs of hope. Many of you may have seen that series that aired nationwide. I interviewed people at the Pentagon, interviewed people from all walks of life and asked them about how they would find hope and peace and security, how they would find meaning and purpose in this time of uncertainty, insecurity and terrorism. I interviewed the pilot's wife of the airplane that went down in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. You remember a number of the uh, passengers attacked those terrorist hijackers that were aboard that plane. 
I interviewed Melody Homer in her home not far from the uh, airport in New Jersey where her husband took off. I, from. I was amazed at her courage and her faith. I was amazed at the peace that God gave to her. In these terrorist attacks, lives were lost. In fact, in these attacks, over 2,974 people lost their lives. There were another 24 that were missing, and they're certainly presumed to be dead. It was this terrorist attack, probably more than anything else, that led the United States uh, into its deadly war with Iraq. That war has waged now for almost seven years. Baghdad and the cities of Iraq that were quite foreign to our minds have become commonplace and household names. Our men and women have traveled to Iraq. And whatever you think about the war, whether it was justified or unjustified, whatever your thoughts are about it, one thing is for certain. America is embroiled in a war in the Middle East that could explode at any moment to a much larger conflagration. Our war in Iraq and our war in Afghanistan puts us on the verge of war in the Muslim world that is extremely dangerous. One psychologist in Newsweek magazine, March 3, 2003, said this, the terrible consequence of an unjustified preemptive strike, he believed, of course, that the invasion of Iraq was unjustified, but notice what he says, it'll turn a billion Muslims into enemies when we might have lived in peace. It'll be a step toward Armageddon. Will Armageddon, Earth's last war, mentioned in the book of Revelation, will Armageddon explode in the Middle East? Will the war in the Middle East turn into a great conflagration? What is the next world superpower? What's going to happen right on the horizon? Is there any hope for the future? We look to Iraq, we become familiar with scenes of devastation and death. We become familiar with roadside bombs exploding and blowing up. And deep within our hearts, we ask the question, what's next? U.S. troop deaths in Iraq total over 4,000. But is this war in Iraq opening a larger war in the Middle East? Will there be many more deaths yet to come, or will we be able to move out of the Middle East fairly quickly? What is on the horizon? What does the future hold? Will more children die? And is this just the beginning when you combine the collapsing American and worldwide economy, when you combine the terrible uh, crash in the stock market, when you look at the housing foreclosures, is America that once was a superpower, is that power eroding? Will there be other nations that arise that challenge America's authority? What does the future hold? As you go back and look at Iraq, Iraq is really the tale of two leaders, one present and one past. It's really the tale of two cities, one modern and one ancient. And unless you understand the connection of those two leaders, Saddam Hussein, the present leader who now has died, of course, been executed, but the leader that once was, and the ancient leader, Nebuchadnezzar. Unless you understand the relationship between Baghdad and Babylon, unless you understand the relationship with the present and the past, you can never make sense out of what's going on in the world tonight. So let's look at present Baghdad, what it was like before the American attack. Then let's go from present Baghdad to ancient Babylon 600 years before Christ. And then let's go to an amazing prophecy about the past, the present, and the future. 
a prophecy that has been fulfilled over 2,500 years. Modern day Baghdad is quite incredible. Modern day Baghdad, in fact, is a city that was really beautiful. The Tigris River flowed through Baghdad. There were jogging trails along the side of the river. There were hanging gardens along the side of the river, beautiful flower gardens that perfumed the air, swimming pools along the side of that river, many, many tourist attractions. Baghdad was a city of over seven million people, quite a modern city quite a city of prestige in the Middle East called the Pearl of the Middle East. It was a city of smiling and happy children, but it was a city that Saddam Hussein presided over tight-fistedly. He was an iron-fisted dictator. 97% of the population of Baghdad, of course, is Muslim today. These Muslim faith was a faith that, of course, was the dominant, is the dominant religion throughout the Middle East. Saddam Hussein had intentions for Baghdad that were far beyond Iraq. He had intentions for the entire Middle East. Mosques dot the landscape of Baghdad, and they dot the landscape of Iraq. If you're there any Friday, and those mosques, you'll hear the turret and the minarets calling to worship and thousands of course Muslims who go to worship on those Fridays. Names like Fallujah are very common to us today. One of the cities of militants against the American soldiers, great battles took place in Fallujah and places like Ramadi. What does this have to do with the past? What does it have to do with Bible prophecy? And how does Saddam Hussein tie in to all of this. Saddam Hussein's ambition was to bring Iraq into dominance in the Middle East. And Saddam had a hero. And unless you understand who Saddam's hero was, you'll not understand why Saddam acted the way that he did. Saddam Hussein's hero was a hero from the past. He was a ruler of ancient Babylon, which is in the area of Iraq. Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians dominated from the lands that we know as Iraq today, the Middle East for over 600 years. They, Nebuchadnezzar ruled from 605 years before Christ and his empire ruled with other Babylonian leaders till 539 before Christ. Saddam's hero was indeed Nebuchadnezzar. Saddam minted a coin with two faces his own on one side, and his heroes, Nebuchadnezzar, on the other side. And the title of that coin is very significant. The title of that coin, the inscription on the coin, is the New Babylon. The New Babylon. What was Saddam's intent? It was to spread his influence over the entire Middle East. It was to spread his influence throughout the lands of the Middle East and it was to attack and overthrow Jerusalem and be a dominant power like his hero Nebuchadnezzar was so dominant. Peter Arnett, CNN war correspondent, saw this link between Saddam Hussein and Nebuchadnezzar of old. Once you understand this, you can understand prophecy. CNN, CNN war correspondent Peter Arnett said, the exploits of Nebuchadnezzar had and have a profound effect on how Saddam views the world in general, in Israel in particular. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar attacked Israel, the king of Babylon, he overthrew it, set up a, a leading part of his government in Jerusalem. That is Saddam's intent as well, according to Peter Arnett, war correspondent. Eric H. Klein, PhD historian and archeologist at George Washington University, talked about Saddam's intent as well. He said, Saddam also portrays himself as the successor to Nebuchadnezzar. In 1979, he was quoted by his semi-official biographer as saying, so here is the biographer, the one that wrote the biography of Saddam Hussein, quoting Saddam Hussein. And this is what Saddam said. Nebuchadnezzar, that's the Babylonian leader that lived 600 years before Christ, Nebuchadnezzar stirs in me 
everything relating to pre-Islamic ancient history. He goes on, and what is most important to me about Nebuchadnezzar is the link, now this is Saddam talking, between the Arabs' abilities and the liberation of Palestine. Nebuchadnezzar was, after all, an Arab from Iraq, albeit ancient Iraq. In other words, Saddam said, Nebuchadnezzar attacked Jerusalem. He liberated Palestine. That was, Nebuchadnezzar, that was Saddam's ambition. You are looking at an amazing photograph, and you are one of the first audiences in America to see that photograph. This is a billboard a picture taken by one of our American soldiers that, that I was able to get it from. This billboard is a picture in Babylon, which is 54 miles south of Baghdad. Notice the billboard. Here is Saddam Hussein in his profile. Right next to Saddam, here is Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is in his war chariot, racing to Israel, Saddam with his modern weapons of warfare. The Bible talks about Nebuchadnezzar and his attack on Jerusalem. This indeed was part of Saddam's intention. Time magazine captured the essence of what was really going on here, and Time said this in its article, Time magazine, August 1990. This is before the uh, terrorist attacks in 2001, before America's invasion of Iraq. Saddam himself, had himself photographed not long ago in a replica of the war chariot of Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king whom Saddam apparently reveres as his hero. Then the article goes on in time. Despite a bout of insanity, which is recounted in the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar made his name in history by destroying Jerusalem in 587 BC and driving its inhabitants into 70 years of captivity. Time Magazine said it's fair warning. In other words, fair warning to Israel because Saddam Hussein had himself photographed in the war chariot of Nebuchadnezzar. You're gonna see that for the first time here in America. Here it is, the war chariot of Nebuchadnezzar. And here in his war chariot, you see Saddam's picture. He had a sense of destiny. He believed that he was to be the Middle East new Nebuchadnezzar, yet, the Bible is very plain. You see, Babylon was 54 miles south of Baghdad. It was the capital of Iraq. But the Bible points out that Babylon was destroyed, never to be rebuilt again. What's the history of this ancient city of Babylon? Babylon was founded after the great flood as the center of the kingdom of Nimrod. You remember reading in the Bible about a tower called the Tower of what? What was that tower called? Tower of Babel. Well, you should have known it. I put it right on the screen here. <laughs> Scholars believe that this ancient site of the Tower of Babel was the place that Babylon was founded on. You know, what are the first four letters in Babylon? They are B A what? B A B Y. Why do you call a baby a baby? You call a baby a baby because it babbles. See, and that's where God confused the languages at Babel, and that's where we get the name baby. Well, at least you learn one thing from the lecture tonight, right? You know where baby comes from. All right, so scholars believe that this ancient site of the Tower of Babel, or Babel, was the place that Babylon, the city of Babylon, was built. I want to take you back with me tonight, back with me to an ancient king's dream. Now, Jesus tells us, if you're going to understand history, if you're going to understand what's going on in the world, you need to go back to an ancient prophet. That prophet's name was Daniel. Matthew 24, verse 15, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by, by who, everybody? Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. Whoever reads, let him understand. So Jesus is talking about the end times. He's talking about the signs of the last days. And Jesus says, you need to read and understand somebody. California, Washington, D.C., Michigan. Who do you need to read and understand? In Orlando, who are we supposed to read and understand? Read and understand what book of the Bible? Daniel. So come back with me tonight to an ancient king's bedroom. This story is recorded in the book of Daniel. This story is recorded about an ancient king called King Nebuchadnezzar, who was Saddam's hero. One night, Nebuchadnezzar went to sleep. 
And as he went to sleep, he had a dream, a dream that he could not remember when he woke up the next morning. It's recorded this way in Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. Let's read it together. Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. So this ancient king had a dream, and he woke up the next morning, and he couldn't remember what he dreamt. So he called his wise men. He called all of the soothsayers and the psychics from Babylon. And he said, I had a dream. I was in my bedroom and I dreamed and I woke up and I couldn't remember what I dreamed, but I know that my dream was significant. Did you ever have a dream? And you wake up the next morning and say, man, I dreamed. I dreamed I was wrestling a lion. But I, I don't know what it meant because as I was wrestling, I think I was winning, but maybe I was losing when I wrestled that line, but I woke up right in the middle of my dream. But I can't remember the ending of the dream. I can't remember my dream. I don't know, maybe you had too much pizza the night before, and your stomach was all churning and had a dream. Now, I'm going to guarantee you, Nebuchadnezzar was not eating Domino's pizza. He wasn't eating Pizza Hut pizza, and he wasn't eating any other kind of pizza. God revealed to him in that bedroom a dream. He called around his astrologers. He said, look at the stars. What did I dream? Tell me. He called around his magicians. What did I dream? Tell me. And they said, King, we can't tell you what you dreamt, but if you tell us what you dreamt, we'll tell you what it means. He said, what do you think, I'm stupid? I wasn't made king for nothing. If you can't tell me what I dreamt 24 hours ago, how are you going to tell me what's going to happen 24 years in the future? Now look, you guys, you tell me what I dreamt. And if you don't do that, I'm going to cut off your hands, cut off your arms, cut off your legs, and I'm going to cut off your head, and then you're really going to be in trouble. The, there was a young man in Daniel's kingdom rather in, in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, his name was Daniel. He was a young Jew, he was taken captive. He was 17 years old when he was taken captive. And he came into the king and he said, King, look, you give me some time and I'm gonna pray. And as I pray, I know that God is gonna reveal to me the dream. And the king said, okay, young man, you take some time and you pray. And when Daniel didn't know what to do, he knew what to do. There may be times in your life that it's dark, there's some real problems in your life. And the God who answered Daniel's prayer will answer your prayer. The God who revealed to Daniel in that tough time of his life meaning and purpose in the future, maybe you're confused tonight about the future, maybe you're uncertain about the future. The future is in God's hands, and God reveals that future. And Daniel went out to pray, and Daniel came back to the king, and he said to the king in Daniel 2, verse 28, let's read it together. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. I love that. Daniel comes into the king, he says, there is a God in heaven. Not maybe there's a God in heaven. Not perhaps there's a God in heaven. Not I think there's a God in heaven. Not it's highly likely there's a God in heaven. Not there's a statistical possibility there's a God in heaven. I love the certainty of it. Nebuchadnezzar, there is a God in heaven. There is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. Nebuchadnezzar, you had a dream, and God is gonna reveal the secrets of the future. God's gonna reveal not only what happens in the days of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, but God's gonna reveal the rise and fall of empires. In this king's dream, you and I see the four nations that would ever rule the world, the four dominant powers in the world, they're named by God. You and I see history being fulfilled before our very eyes. In this dream, we see 2,500 years of history. It's an incredible dream. It names the rise and fall of empires. It names world leaders before their birth. It is an incredible dream. Tonight, we're gonna study Daniel chapter two because this dream takes us from Nebuchadnezzar's day, look at the screen, it takes us from Nebuchadnezzar's day, that king of Babylon, down to what days? Down to what days? The latter days. So here is a dream that takes us down the stream of time for 2,500 years and focuses on our day. We can face the future with hope and with confidence. Daniel says to the king, King, Daniel 2 verse 31, you, O king, were watching. And behold, a great image, this great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you, and its form was awesome. And as you looked, O king, the image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, 
its belly and thighs of brass, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Yes, Daniel, that's exactly what I saw. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then, O king, the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like the chaff from a summer threshing floors. And king, the wind carried them away, so no trace was found for them. As the king stood back, he stood back in awe and wonder and amazement. Then Daniel went on as he described the dream to the king. Daniel 2, verse 35, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. As Daniel described that dream to the king, I, am, I can imagine that the king stood back and he said, Daniel, Daniel, that's exactly what I saw. I had this dream and I saw this great image, Daniel. And as the image emerged, Daniel, yes, indeed, the image had a head of gold. And Daniel, the image had breasts and arms of silver. It's exactly what I saw. And it had thighs of brass and legs of iron. And Daniel, I saw those feet of iron and clay. And then Daniel, I saw that stone that stone cut out of the mountain without hands, that stone that came and crushed the image and ground it to powder, that stone that became a mountain and filled the whole earth. If you were Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel had just described your dream and that dream was described exactly, what would your next question B. What would your next question be? What does it mean? You know, some people say, well, you know, you read the Bible and you read Bible prophecy, and Bible prophecy is all a matter of individual interpretation. This person says it means this. This person says it means that. You can never really know what Bible prophecy means. Who gave this prophecy to King Nebuchadnezzar? Who gave the dream to Nebuchadnezzar? God. If God gave the dream to Nebuchadnezzar, do you give God credit that he would make the dream plain? Or is God so mixed up that he would make the dream so confusing that nobody should understand it? The same God that revealed the prophecy to Nebuchadnezzar must explain the prophecy through Daniel to Nebuchadnezzar. Does that make sense? Did God give the prophecy to make things foggy and unclear, or did God give the prophecy to make things very clear? Well, maybe here's a good idea tonight. Suppose you never heard anything about that prophecy before, and suppose you never read about this prophecy, and I said, I know what. Here's an idea I have for you. If we're going to understand the prophecy, let's do this. I'll give every one of you a little piece of paper and you wildly guess and speculate what you think the prophecy means. Write it down on the piece of paper. And then we'll pass a basket. Everybody drops in their piece of paper. Somebody brings me up this big, huge basket with hundreds of pieces of paper. I'm going to close my eyes, pick one out of the basket. Whichever one I pick, that's what the prophecy means, right? Is that a good way to determine what prophecy means? Not at all. The same God that gave the prophecy is the God that interprets it. So God comes through Daniel, and Daniel says, after he has prayed, Daniel says to the king, Daniel 2, verse 36, this is the dream, and now, next word, everybody, now what? We. Who are the we? Who's the we? Who's the we? God and Daniel. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. Now this is absolutely amazing. This dream takes us 2,500 years through history. This dream gives us confidence as we face the future. We will tell the interpretation. Daniel 2, verse 37 and 38. You, O king, are a king of kings. You, that is you, Nebuchadnezzar, you, that is your empire, Babylon, are this head of gold. We don't have to guess what the head of gold represents because God, through Daniel, 
told King Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. Now, gold was a very fitting symbol of Babylon. Babylon ruled the world from 605 B.C. to 539 B.C. Babylon was a lavish empire in what we now know is the country of Iraq. Babylon was a magnificent city. Let's look at some of the structure of Babylon. Let's look at the largeness of Babylon. Let's take a look at the splendor and wealth of that city. Babylon was the world dominant power. It had more than 200 temples dedicated to pagan gods. Babylon was a city that, that was walled both on the, with outer walls and inner walls, and those walls around the city were pierced with eight gates. The walls were so wide that three chariots could race side by side on the top of the walls. The walls were some 60 feet high. They were some six stories high. It was really a magnificent city. The most important gate was called the Ishtar Gate. And when Nebuchadnezzar came back with his armies, he would march them down a way called Procession Way, and he would march them through the Ishtar Gate. Procession Way was lined with lions, with eagles' wings, and a variety of mystic-like animals in blue-glazed tile. Truly, Babylon was one of the most magnificent capitals of the world. It had one of the seven wonders of the world, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar's wife was from Lebanon, the country of Lebanon. She missed the cedars of Lebanon, so he built gardens, terraced gardens for his wife that were a reminder of her homeland. Babylon was 10 miles around. If you hiked around it, you hiked 10 miles. Now in comparison, Rome was six miles around, and Athens was only four miles. So Babylon was two and a half times the size of Athens and bigger than Rome. The city of Babylon was a city that was incredibly magnificent. It had a temple to the pagan god Belmarduk, who was the chief god of Babylon. This temple was 300 feet high. Outside, it had blue glazed tile. Inside, it was overlaid with gold. Now, the temple dedicated to this pagan god of Belmarduk had a Eight, it contained 18 tons of gold in the altar and thrown alone. Do you see why God said that you, O oh Nebuchadnezzar, are this head of gold? Because the golden dome temple of Bel Marduk had these 18 tons of gold, both in the altar and the throne. Babylon was a world ruling. Babylon was a world dominant power. Babylon. This power had a 20-year food supply. So the Babylonians weren't worried about any enemy's attacks because when the Medes and Persians later surrounded the Babylonians, the Babylonians, history tells us, went up on the wall, threw food over the wall to the Medes and Persians and said to the Medes and Persians, hey, you guys, you're surrounding us. You think you're going to starve us? We have a 20-year food supply. Hey, you soldiers out there that are surrounding us, you guys may be a little hungry. Here's a little food for you. And so they threw food over the walls, taunting the soldiers. They weren't worried about water because the river Euphrates ran through the center of Babylon, giving them a constant water supply. The river Euphrates was that river which supplied water endlessly to the Babylonians. Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 4 verse 30 said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and the honor of my majesty? Nebuchadnezzar was filled with arrogance. He was filled with pride. He had a super ego. He said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built. Now notice, in the archaeological ruins of Babylon, here is ancient Babylon, now destroyed. Here are the bricks of Babylon. And every brick of Babylon had Nebuchadnezzar's name stamped on that brick. 
But look, right above those bricks is a newer area that Saddam Hussein thought he would defy Bible prophecy and Saddam Hussein began to build new Babylon in this section and every one of Saddam's bricks had Saddam's name stamped upon them. But what did God's word say? Jeremiah 51 verse 37, Babylon will become a heap of ruins, a haunt of jackals, an object of horror and scorn, a place where no one lives. So the Bible predicted that Babylon would be destroyed. We're following a journey. You have that great image, the head of gold representing Babylon. But the image is not all gold. Babylon would be destroyed and another nation would rise up, the nation of the Medes and the Persians. The Persians and the Medes attack Babylon, 539. B.C. to 331 B.C., the chest and arms of silver representing the nation of the Medes and representing the Persians. Daniel 2, verse 32, its chest and arms of silver. Every metal represents another empire. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 2, after you shall arise another kingdom. So the head of gold representing Babylon, the first kingdom. Breast and arms of silver representing Medo-Persia, the second kingdom. How did Babylon fall to Medo-Persia on one night? There was a feast of debauchery and immorality. The wine flowed, the music played, finely gowned women danced in gyrations as Babylonian men half drunk in their sensuality committed immorality and there God said Babylon this is enough that night a bloodless hand wrote on the wall many many thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting God has numbered your kingdom, Babylon. This is Babylon's last night. Then the Bible says, Tekel, you've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Babylon's last night. Then the Bible says, Paris, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. That night, Babylon fell, exactly like Bible prophecy predicted. But how did Babylon fall? Who was the general that led the armies against Babylon? God named Cyrus, the Persian general that attacked Babylon 150 years before he was born. Now this is incredible, incredible. You say, where is that in the Bible? Here it is in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 45, verse one. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him. Cyrus was God's anointed to attack Babylon, to overthrow it, because Babylon had attacked Jerusalem. The Jews were in captive to Babylon. God raised up Cyrus. God named Cyrus in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah was written in 680 BC. The attack on Babylon came in 539. So 150 years plus in advance, God named this man Cyrus that would attack Babylon. He would loose the armor of kings. He would open before him the double doors. The gates would not be shut. Cyrus would attack Babylon. As he attacked it, the Bible says the river would become dry. What's that all about? And the Bible says the gates would not be shut. What's that about? The Cyrus Cylinder is a rock record that is housed in the British Museum that describes how Cyrus attacked Babylon and how Babylon fell. Here is what the Bible says. Now Herodotus tells us that Cyrus planned to march on Babylon in the spring. This is confirmed in Bible prophecy, but one of Cyrus's sacred horses drowned in the river. Cyrus, the Persian general, became so angry, he became so upset that he orders his armies to stop their attack on Babylon. They dug 360 channels and spread the river out over the plain. What happened to the river? You remember the, Tig the, the Euphrates River ran through the center of Babylon? The water level dropped. The river became dry. 
Cyrus marched his troops down the dry riverbed under the walls. They came up in the center of the city because Babylon had a drunken feast. The gates were left open, and in one night, Babylon's armies fell. The drying up of the rivers delayed the destruction till the next year. In 539 BC, the Babylonians fell to Cyrus's forces. Cyrus dried up the river. He sent his forces down the dry river bed. The gates on the inner gates were left open because of the drunken feast. All of this is recorded on the Cyrus Cylinder. And the Cyrus cylinder in the rock records confirms exactly what happened in the Bible. The Bible is no common book. The Bible is no ordinary book. It is a book that's inspired by the living God. The past in the Bible has been fulfilled, and we can have confidence to be fulfilled in the future. Daniel 2 verse 39 says, that another kingdom, a third kingdom of bronze, that will rule over all the earth, Babylon, the head of gold. Meet of Persia, the breast and arms of silver. Greece, the thighs of bronze. Why did God use bronze for the thighs of Greece? Because the Greek armies always had bronze helmets. They had bronze armor. And so bronze was a fitting symbol for Greece, just like gold was a fitting symbol for the nation of Babylon. Alexander the Great attacked the Medo-Persian armies, and he overthrew the Medes and the Persians. History is following this prophecy like a blueprint. Alexander the Great planned to rebuild the temple tower at Babylon. And he, he wanted to make the city of Babylon his provincial capital. But what did God say? It said Babylon would be destroyed. It said Babylon would never be rebuilt again. What happened? For two months, 10,000 Greeks, Greek men, worked clearing away the debris of Babylon to rebuild it as a provincial capital for Alexander. But during this period, Alexander died and the project was abandoned. Babylon would rule. Then Medo-Persia would rule. Then Greece would rule. History has been following this image of Daniel, the second chapter, like a blueprint. History has been following clearly this outline. Then the fourth empire, gold, silver, bronze, iron, Rome with the legs of iron would rule from 168 years before Christ to 476 years after Christ. We see exactly like the Bible predicted, the fourth kingdom will be as strong as iron. The Roman Empire was that nation that reached out across Europe, and indeed, it was as strong as iron. The Roman armies dominated all of Europe. The Roman armies dominated down into Africa. The Roman armies dominated down into the areas of Asia. We see this prophecy being fulfilled. Edward Gibbon, who wrote the book, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, uses this prophecy as a model for the history of Rome. He says, the images of gold, silver, or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successfully broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. Isn't it amazing that, that the historian uses the very words of Bible prophecy to describe these legs of iron. But what would happen after Babylon, after Medo-Persia, after Greece, after Rome? You know, it was the Roman Empire that was ruling in the days of Jesus. When Jesus was born, it was a decree of Caesar Augustus that brought Jesus, brought the parents of Jesus, Mary and Joseph, to Bethlehem. You remember it was a Roman emperor that wanted to kill all boy babies that sent the Holy Family to Egypt into hiding for that short period of time where they were nourished. It was too a Roman governor that was the one that tried Jesus. It was a Roman governor that condemned Jesus to death and Roman soldiers nailed Jesus to the cross. So this fourth empire, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, we see Jesus living in the days of this Roman empire. This empire that extended throughout Europe, this empire that extended down into Africa and on to the Middle East. But what would happen next? 
Would there be a fifth world ruling empire after Rome? What happened next? Babylon, the head of gold. Persia, the chest and arms of silver. Greece, the thighs of brass. Rome, the legs of iron. If I were predicting, I'd predict gold, silver, brass, iron, copper, tin, zinc, aluminum. You know, you'd think, you know, wouldn't you think that there'd be four world ruling nations, then there'd be a fifth world ruling nation, then there'd be a sixth, a seventh? Wouldn't you think that? But what do you know about Rome? Was Rome conquered by a fifth world ruling nation? What do you know about Rome? Rome was what? Rome was divided. Hence, the toes of the image of the clay and the iron. Look at how the Bible is so accurate to history. The Bible says, Daniel 2, verse 42, whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be, shall be what, everybody? Divided. So the Roman Empire would not be overthrown by a fifth world ruling empire. The Roman Empire would be what? Divided. Did that happen? Indeed it did. The toes of the image represent the divisions of the Roman Empire. You recall what happened. The barbarian tribes came down from the north. And as they did, they attacked the Roman Empire and divided it up. And what we see in Europe today are the remnants of that old Roman Empire. For example, the Franks settled in the area that we now know as France, that's right. The Anglo-Saxons settled in the area we now know as England. The Alamanni settled in the area of Germany. The Heruli settled in the area of Italy. The Visigoths down here, some in southern Spain. The Suevi up in Portugal. The Vandals here in Africa. So what we see today in Europe are the divisions of the old Roman Empire. I remember one time I was preaching in Europe and a guy came up to me, he was quite a skeptical, and he said, how do you know the Bible is true? And I said something like this, you're standing on it. He kind of looked around, what, 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 what's the guy talking about? He said, how do you know the Bible's true? I said, you're standing on it. He said, what do you mean? I said, the Bible predicted there'd be Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome. Then the Bible predicted that the Roman Empire would be divided. It was divided. And it's been divided for 1,500 years. The soil that you are standing on is one of the greatest evidences that the Bible indeed is the Word of God. But the Bible goes on and the prophecy becomes even more incredible. You see, the Roman Empire fell apart from 351 to 476 AD. But God makes a prediction that is very precise in the book of Daniel. He says, Daniel 2 verse 43, after the Rome is divided, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. What do you think it means that the emperors and kings of Europe would mingle the seeds? What do you think that means? That's it. They would intermarry. They would intermarry in an attempt. You'd have one king that would marry off his son, a prince, to another princess with a chance of trying to unite all Europe through that intermarriage. Come with me to the Fredericksburg Castle in Denmark. My wife and I lived in England for five years, 1985 to 1990, and we traveled all through Europe. If you go up to the Fredericksburg Castle in Denmark, you travel through the beautiful courtyard into the foyer or the entryway of the castle. Once you get into that castle, there is something that to me is quite amazing and astounding. Here is the family tree of Europe showing the interrelationship through intermarriage of the kings and queens of Europe in an attempt to unite all of Europe exactly like the Bible prophecy said. Bible says there would be Babylon, it would fall, it did. There'd be Medo Persia, it would fall, it did. Cyrus was named 150 years in advance of his birth. He would be the ruler that would attack Babylon, he did. He would dry up the river according to the Bible prophecy, he did. The gates would be opened, they were on that drunken night. Then Greece would come under Alexander, that happened. Alexander would try to rebuild Babylon, that he failed, he died, exactly like the Bible said, Babylon would not be rebuilt. Then. Greek empire would fall, Rome would rule, it would be an iron monarchy, it was. 
Then, after that, it would be divided, not conquered by a fifth world ruling empire. That happened. Rome would be divided. They'd try to, me- try to unite Europe through intermarriage. They tried to do that, but it never happened. Ladies and gentlemen, history is not a wild affair of events. History is following this book like a blueprint. God is in control. He sits upon his throne. Napoleon, divorced. Josephine married Louise of Austria to try to unite all Europe, but Napoleon failed. Napoleon was defeated in the Battle of Waterloo. They will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere one to another as iron is not mixed with clay. When Napoleon was defeated, he cried out, God is too much for me. Charles V tried to unite all of Europe, and he failed. Charlemagne tried to unite all of Europe, but Charlemagne could not have and unite the Holy Roman Empire. He failed. Would-be rulers have arisen. They've tried to unite Europe, but they have failed. Again, Napoleon, Battle of Waterloo, 1815. And as Napoleon came to the Battle of Waterloo, he was utterly defeated because you cannot unite the clay and the iron in the feet of that image. That image has revealed history in advance. Here's what Napoleon's journal said. There will be one Europe. There will be one currency. There will be one language. There will be one government all over Europe. But Napoleon was defeated. Napoleon's armies went down in defeat. Why did these armies of Napoleon go down in such defeat? Because God intervened in history. In fact, right after this tragic defeat at Napoleon that nobody expected, Napoleon cried out, God Almighty is too much for me. You know, there was a history written of Napoleon's defeat. It's called Lectures on Modern History, Lecture 3, by a man by the name of Professor Arnold. And he says, what was the principal adversary of this tremendous power? By whom was it checked and resisted and put down? By none and by nothing but the direct and manifest interposition of God. God has intervened in human history. God is in control of human history. Europe has been divided exactly like the Bible has said down through the years. Would-be world leaders in World War I and World War II have tried to unite Europe. Hitler, Stalin, Mussolini, all have tried to bring Europe together, but they have failed. Hitler said there'll be one people. Hitler said there'll be one empire. Hitler said there'll be one leader, but he was defeated. Why? Because prophecy cannot be broken. There is an event just on the horizon. We're not living in the head of gold. We're not living in the breasts and arms of silver. We're not living in the thighs of brass. We're not living in the legs of iron. We're not living right down there when Europe was first divided. We are living in the toenails, the toenails of that image. What's the next event? What is the next event that Daniel described regarding the image to King Nebuchadnezzar? What is the next event that's just on the horizon? What's the next event for human history? Daniel 2, verse 34, you watched. Well, a stone was cut out without hands. See, here's an empire without human hands. This stone cut out without hands is not some nuclear bomb that's going to explode. Here, the stone that's cut out without hands is the rock of ages, Jesus Christ, who will come again. You watched. You watched till a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. The God of heaven, Daniel said, would set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Babylon rose and fell. Nebuchadnezzar rose and fell. Saddam Hussein rose and fell. Medo-Persia rose and fell. Cyrus rose and fell. Greece rose and fell. Alexander rose and fell. Rome and the Caesars rose and fell. Europe was divided. In the rise and fall of nations, God has the destiny of this world in his hands. 
God is still in control. God is on the throne, and soon the rock cut out without hands, the divine, eternal, everlasting kingdom of Jesus Christ will come. It will break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. God's kingdom will stand. We need not fear. We need not fear. This earth isn't going to be destroyed in some thermonuclear warfare. We need not fear. We're not going to spend the last moments of life clawing at one another for living space. We need not fear. This world is not going to be destroyed by some global warming. We are living down in the toenails of the image. 2,500 years of history has been fulfilled. We need not fear. One day, Jesus will come. One day, he'll stream down the court of the sky. One day, sickness and suffering and heartache and sin will be over. One day, there'll be no more war, no more worry, no more want. One day, there'll be no more disease, no more disaster, no more death. One day, there'll be no more poverty, no more pollution. One day, we will say, there's no more night, no more night, no more dark periods of sorrow and disappointment and devastation and discouragement. No more night. One day we'll see his face and live in his glory forever. Listen as Jennifer and Sandy sing No More Night. The timeless theme, earth and heaven. It's not a dream, God will make all things new that day. Gone is the curse from which I stumbled and fell. Evil is banished to eternity.
Amen. 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 I want to live with Jesus one day in a land where there's no sickness or suffering or pain or death. Don't you? If you want to do that, just raise your hand as I pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much that we can live in that land with Jesus, where there's no sickness or pain. Thank you that this world is not in the hands of man, but it's in the hands of the living God. In Christ's name, amen. Let me tell you a little bit about tomorrow night. Tomorrow we're talking about Jesus, the Jews, and Jerusalem. We're looking at the end time signs that Jesus gave. How soon are we to that day when the rock smites the image? Could Christ come in our day? What are the signs? Don't miss tomorrow, four o'clock, seven o'clock, two identical sessions. When you go out tonight, be sure, if you're new here tonight, be sure to pick up one of the lectures for tonight. And if you've come last night, be sure to pick up your lecture.